from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi everybody, welcome to this Cube conversation. Michael Gray is here. He's the Chief Technology Officer of Boston-based Thrive. Michael, good to see you. Thanks hey, for coming on. Glad to be here. So tell us about Thrive. What are you guys all about? Uh, you know, Thrive started uh, almost 20 years ago as a traditional managed service provider, but really in the past four to five years transformed into a next generation managed service provider. Primarily now we're focusing on cybersecurity, cloud hosting, and uh, uh, public cloud hosting as well as disaster recovery. So dig into that, next generation. Yep. People use that term, but what does it mean? Well, the needs of uh, our customers really changed over time. Uh, before, you could maybe simply roll out some antivirus and do some desktop management, some server management, but with the way some of the innovation has exploded in the cloud and the way application development has changed all of our businesses, we've noticed that our customers have all kinds of new needs. Uh, that includes a high, much higher focus on cybersecurity. These things can't be an after, afterthought. The other thing was with all the data that we see coming from our customers, they need a much higher level of performance than they ever did before from their their, their local hosting or, or in the cloud. So when Amazon Web Services came out in you know 2006 timeframe, everybody said, oh, MSPs like, like Thrive, they're in big trouble. The exact opposite has happened. It's yep. been a boom yep. for your business, yep. a tailwind. Yep. Yep. You know, why is that, number one? And number two, how do you compete with the big cloud providers? You know, somebody like Amazon or, or even Azure, those services are not easy to roll out. You still need someone to understand what the business needs are and then translate those into technology solutions. For us, when someone starts asking, how do I transform my business, whether it be in the public cloud or the private cloud, that's a tremendous opportunity to bring our knowledge and all of our engineering support to those customers to help them transform. So, I mean, I, I liken it to, you know, I could hire a plumber, I could hire an electrician, I could hire a carpenter, but I don't want to be the general contractor. I'm happy, happy to pay an expert at that who's got, contacts, deep expertise, and, and and push the responsibility on them. Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, I do think it is fair. Um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a much more um, uh, technical environment than something like that. So it's much more complicated. Yeah, of, of, of course, of course. But, you know, the other thing is when we uh, start to understand some of these business problems and pull the pieces apart, we have a tremendous amount of expertise and experience where we can help those customers understand how to solve those business problems, uh, how to implement the technology, and then how to be successful in whatever way they're trying to transform their business. So you sort of touched on some of the, the trends in your business. Talk more about your customers. It's, it's my understanding is it's mostly small and mid-sized customers, is that correct? You know, there's far more mid-market uh, than there ever were before. I think people in the mid-market are realizing that they do need to take some of these services outside their walls. I notice a lot of mid-market customers that are focusing on their core business. If you're a manufacturing company, a biotech, a financial services company, you can realize very quickly that you're not in the cloud hosting business. And no matter how many people they hire or grow your staff, it can be very difficult to actually be successful in these technologies. Despite uh, all the different pieces that Amazon or, or Azure offers in the public cloud, you still have to figure out how all these systems work and how they apply to your business. Well, I too, the mid-sized companies and especially small companies, they obviously don't have the resources that a large company has, so you bring a lot of that infrastructure expertise along. Yeah, and I think part of it is, you know, we have such a big exposure to a very large customer base, so a problem that a customer may see that, that, that they think is maybe perhaps special to them, we've solved that problem maybe hundreds of times. And we can give them a lot of insight into how other companies of similar verticals have solved those problems. So did you start out as sort of a, a local MSP and then have expanded over time? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, we've expanded pretty rapidly over the past three Three to four years. Uh, now we're uh, we have five offices, uh, primarily in the East Coast, and uh, really um, started to help the mid market, who's now started to understand that they need to, frankly, outsource some of these solutions or uh, get in business with a partner like us, who can help them uh, take those outside their walls and provide them a much higher level of service. Often, at at the end of the day, the investment's much lower for the customer. So paint a picture of your, your infrastructure. What does yep. it look like? And yep. then we yep. can get into that a little so bit. So we have uh, eight data centers. Uh, you know, I have three uh, primary data centers um, uh, in New England, uh, the New Jersey, New York area, uh, and then uh, in the South. Uh, all those data centers uh, actually have Infinidat storage. Um, 
which is you know something that I'm a, a huge fan of. And one of the things that I like to offer in all of our data centers is I don't necessarily, uh, it doesn't matter to me geographically where the customer would like their workloads. That's one of the things that the public cloud offers. You can move resources around uh, geographically depending maybe where your headquarters is or some of your branch offices. Uh, we provide the same solutions uh, at often a much higher performance level and we've abstracted all the complications of where to put these. So if a customer is in San Francisco and they'd like to DR to uh, New England, not an issue. But all of a sudden, if they change their headquarters or uh, maybe they do an acquisition and they need to change that footprint, I can change that on the fly for them. So, and I've walked through many data centers of MSPs over the years, and, yeah. and you know, 10 years ago, yep. you had one of everything. I yep. think, even recently, I saw yep. a Compaq server yep. the other day. Yep. Yep. And so, uh, I would imagine you had similar challenges. You mentioned Infinidat. Are you yep. trying to essentially run your entire yep. storage infrastructure yeah. on Infinidat? Yeah, so we've, um, We've acquired several other MSPs uh, over the past several years. We had a lot of disparate storage platforms. A lot of investments made, some of them hung on to maybe for too long, some of them uh, you know, were purchased for a specific uh, business reason that might not be there anymore. Uh, at this point, we've standardized on Infinidat. Uh, it's enabled our business to do a lot of new and innovative services. So high performance storage replication, similar to what you'd see in the public cloud. Uh, but also we can support uh, very complicated, very data hungry workloads. So you're essentially replacing sort of older storage systems with Infinidat. Um, Maybe you can describe the before and yep. after, and yeah. kind of what the business yeah. impact is. You know, frankly, with with acquiring a lot of um, MSPs, you name a storage platform, we had it mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, through this uh, standardization, the the beauty of it is a consolidation. So I can uh, leverage the folks that manage our Infinidat across the country. Right. And so my TCO on something like this is 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 really kind of amazing. Um, I can leverage a lot of experience with Infinidat when I go in and need to do a data center consolidation. I have some things that are knowns. There's a lot of unknowns in acquisitions. Um, and all the due diligence in the world, there's still going to be things that maybe not every detail has been figured out. But when I roll out an Infinidat, I know I've solved one very foundational problem right out of the gate. So, and I want to come back and double yeah. click on the TCO, but before I do, um, when I, talk to people like you, and I'm not a CTO, uh, but, but a lot of times I infer that people are comparing the the latest and greatest, in this case, Infinidat, yep. with what they had that's five, six, seven years old. Sure. And of course the TCO is going to sure. be better. Sure, 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 be sure. So I'm, I'm going to push you a little bit. Is is I presume you looked at Infinidat and other storage suppliers, uh, and I'm interested in what you found mm -hmm. in, the, in mm -hmm. those comparisons. Is it is it is it just, great TCO relative to what you had that was five years old, or is it relative yeah. to the other landscape? Yeah, yeah, so um, you know when it comes right down to it, I've seen every marketing pitch for a storage platform that you can possibly imagine. I've seen every bullet list of features. Uh, I've seen every, um, we have proprietary technology that does X and Y. Uh, you know, eventually when you put it on the floor, it's not everything that it was in the sales process. Uh, maybe there's something that was uncovered on a licensing side, maybe the performance wasn't quite what someone said it would be. The thing about Infinidat is they've delivered on everything they've said in the sales process, and you don't find that very often. Um, the other thing I, I, I really need to mention too is that even post-sale, uh, the discussion about the technology continues. It's always a d discussion about how the technology is built and how it enables you. Uh, it's not, uh, we have a new feature coming on the roadmap that is going to solve X and Y problem. They, they've worked out the very foundational problems. Um, you know, the other thing I, I do want to mention about Infinidat is being such a strong engineering company, I know that as an engineer I can rely on them to make good engineering decisions. So I want to ask you about performance, because when I first saw Infinidat, you know, we were on the, on the flash bandwagon, we yep. were early on that, yep. and, and, and these guys came in and said, Actually, we can beat flash performance using you know, our architecture and software and so forth. Yep, so you're like, yep. really? So I'll ask you. Yeah. Um, have you found that uh, from a performance standpoint? So I have, and you know, I run into a lot of situations where um, there's technology leaders um, that are maybe buying into a specific brand name, 
you know, if we put X technology in, I know for a fact that it's gonna beat the performance of an Infinidat. Uh, my approach with that is I've seen all the platforms and I agree there's a lot of uh, great products out there, high performance. Sit down and take a look at the way the technology has been built and have an open mind and you'll most likely be convinced that that technology is the right answer. Uh, I, a lot of times I like to sit back and, and say, look, I'm not gonna push any vendor, any software partner, any uh, manufacturer on you. Take a step back and have an open mind to technology. It'll make a big difference when you actually listen to well, it. Well, I'm sure you've heard the sales pitches. Oh, you're using those slow spinning discs. Mike, spinning discs are mechanical. Yeah, Let me explain about yeah, that. So, yeah, but, yeah. But your experience has been, and we, we've had Brian Carmody on, yep, and, yep. and some others, uh, yep. and certainly we have Moshe come in here yep. and explain that. Sure. Um, and, and so, but I always like to talk to the customer and get the uh, affirmation. Yeah, the yeah. Case. Well, again, to me, the, the conversation with Infinidad is always about engineering. Um, you know, it, it's not a, uh, a great deal of marketing first. Of course, everybody does marketing. That happens on a regular, you have to do that to run a business. But if you want to talk purely about how things have been designed, that conversation often eclipses a lot of other uh, marketing from other storage vendors. So, talk about your, your, how you spend your time. Yep. Are you architecting yep. you know, infrastructure, roadmaps, and so forth? Are you more sort of, I got to get this stuff up and running today. Describe that. Yeah, you know, we we we've uh, set a path to build a very high performance nationwide cloud. Um, we are going up against the public cloud. By the way, I'm a public cloud partner, right? I do both. We do hybrid um, uh, hosting. Uh, I want to give the customer the best of both worlds, which may be a cliche, but we really are aiming to get there. Uh, that's one of my uh, primary tasks: is establishing a technology vision. Um, you know, I can describe to a customer where our cloud is going, and I can stand behind that. With the public cloud, we do have to lose a little bit of reading the tea leaves. Um, so I, I help people with trying to understand what, um, you know, maybe the public cloud vision might be, but also how I fit together with that, that public cloud with private cloud hosting. Uh, and the other thing, uh, primary goal of mine is bringing in uh, some of these um, different functions of IT. So for instance, uh, high performance uh, cloud, private cloud plus cybersecurity. I can bring those two together for you in a cohesive solution. That, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. So as you look out, you know, put on your, your, your binoculars, maybe even your telescope, big trend, and one of the big trends is hyper-converged and bringing in storage, compute, and networking all together. Yep, um, yep. It, if I'm inferring correctly, you're going for more of a best of breed approach. Yep, And, yep. and you guys have the engineering expertise perhaps yep. to do that. Can you, can you talk about the philosophy there? Sure, sure. Well, one of the things that I like to do is just ab abstract some of these confusing and complicated conversations from our customers. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to talk about uh, SD-WAN uh, and make sure I have SD-WAN in my data center, uh, I can tell the customer, I can give you that functionality and you don't have to worry about how these different pieces go together. I'm happy to be transparent. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the public cloud that simply information you can't get. Uh, I'm actually willing to share how those solutions that I built go together uh, because I want people to see that transparent. I want them to trust us. Um, so, you know, when, when we go and start putting these together, these are things where when the customer does have a question, they want to drill in because they have concerns, I can eliminate those very quickly. You talked about private cloud earlier. I, I yeah. want to come back to that. Sure. And just, so we, all, we always say uh, on theCUBE, bring the cloud experience to your, to, to your data, wh yep. wherever it lives. Yep. It's all yep. about that operating model. Yep. You know, yep. It's not about physically yep. where, where it is. But yep. So as you see tool chains like Kubernetes yep. And, yep. and all the, the cloud native stuff yeah. come in, you want to have that cloud experience, you want to have it yeah. yourselves and obviously yep. pass that on to, yep. to yep. your customers. Yep. Um, how do you look at that? Um, yeah. What role does storage infrastructure play in that? To me, uh, and, and this is something that's primary uh, to Thrive's focus is uh, application enablement. We're an application enablement company. So if your application is best run in Azure, uh, then, then we want to put it there. Uh, a lot of times we'll find that um, just due to business problems or legacy technologies, we have to build private clouds uh, or even for security reasons, we want to build private cloud or purely just because we're running into a lot of public cloud refugees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't realize a lot of the uh, maybe incidental fees along the way actually climbed up to be a fairly big budget number. So, you know, we want to really look at uh, people's applications and enable them to be highly high performance, but also highly secure. 
Um, I want to come back to the TCO. I said it was yeah, to do that. Sure. So when you do the, the total cost of ownership analysis, yep. what you find is it, it it really boils down to the to the labor yep. piece of it. Yep. And so yep. I'm curious as to when you brought in Infinidat, yep. what the business impact was, mm -hmm. you know, economically. Yep. And there's, yep. there's other sort yep. of non-TCO factors yep. that I yep. want to explore. Yeah. So was it the labor cost that got reduced? Did you redeploy those resources? Well, or was well, it actually well, the hardware? Or? First and foremost, um, and you know, this is going back many years, but um, and, and I think I would say this is true for any uh, data center cloud provider. The minute the phone rings and someone says, my storage is slow, we're losing money, okay? Because we've had to pick up the phone and someone needs to address that. Um, we have eliminated uh, all storage performance uh, help desk issues. It's now one thing I don't need to think about anymore. Uh, we have, we know that we can rely on our performance and we know we don't need to worry about that on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is not in question. Uh, now the other thing is really as we started to expand our Infinidat footprint geographically, we suddenly started to realize not only do we have this great foundation built, but we can leverage an investment we made to do things that we couldn't do before. Uh, maybe we could do them, but they required uh, another piece of technology. Maybe we could do them or they did the, required some more licensing, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but really when we started the standardization, we did it for operational efficiency reasons, uh, and then suddenly realized that we had other opportunities here, and, and I have to hand it to Infinidet, they're actually the ones that helped us craft this story. Um, not only is this just a solid foundation, but it's something you can build on top of. So, um, you talk about the, the performance, I want to ask you, yeah. I've had, um, Certainly Brian, Carmody, uh, Craig Hibbert uh, and I have sat down and, and Craig actually made the statement, you know, the only bottleneck really is when the, the system gets filled. Yeah. You're describing yeah. the architecture. Has that been your experience that it, it sort of reduced or eliminated traditional storage bottlenecks? Oh, absolutely. And you know, um, I mentioned before that this is, uh, storage performance has now become an afterthought to me. Um, you know, and a little bit the way we look at our storage platform is we, from a performance standpoint, not a capacity standpoint, we can throw whatever we want uh, at the Infinidat. Uh, and sort of the running joke internally is it will just smile and say, is that all you got? You mean like mixed workloads or you don't have to sort of tune each array for a particular workload? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I can imagine as someone that might be listening to what I'm saying, well, hey, come on, you, you know, it can't really be that good. And I'm, I'm telling you from seeing it day to day, uh, again, you can just throw the workloads at it and it will do what it says it does. Um, you don't see that every day. Now, as far as capacity goes, uh, you know, they, uh, there's this capacity on demand model, which uh, you know, we're a huge fan of. Um, they also have some other models, the flex model, which is uh, very useful for uh, budgeting purposes. Um, what I will tell you is, you have to sacrifice uh, at least one floor tile for Infinidat. It's very off-putting uh, at first on day one, and I remember my reaction, but again, as I was saying earlier, when you start peeling back the pieces of the technology and why these things are and the different flexibility uh, on the financial side, uh, you realize th this actually isn't uh, a downside, it's an upside. So the asset leverage of that floor tile is well worth the, the return. Exactly. Uh, they also make a big deal about a petabyte yep. scale. Is that yep. important to you? Or what kind of scale are we talking about in terms of if you can share? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we obviously have multiple petabytes of storage uh, for Thrive uh, for our customers. Uh, again, you know, when someone has a large data set, if we were to say we, we cannot handle that, uh, we're going to be out of business pretty quickly. Um, this is one of the things, the infinite flexibility of the public cloud. Again, if, if you consider the public cloud both our competition and our partner, um, you know, we need to be able to offer that same kind of elasticity and that same kind of um, endless capacity. Uh, and at this point, um, although I don't have completely endless capacity, I have a tremendous amount of options. I have workloads I can move different places. Uh, and again, a lot of times now it's more about performance than it is capacity. Uh, you got to give me something. I okay. Mean, give me something that you want, the, the Infinidat should be doing to make your life better. Yeah, I mean, uh, I got to tell you, it solves so many problems that is actually hard to, to come up with. And again, I'm, I'm smiling here because I've been down this road with other storage providers. I, I've been let down by other storage providers. I guess to some degree, I, uh, maybe I'm waiting for them to let me down, but I don't think they're going to. Um, and that's a really interesting part. I think that um, you know the Nutrix Cloud, which is something that's been added uh, over time, uh, you know, public cloud interaction is something that um, is desperately needed in the storage space. So I'm interested to see how that product grows. If I'm going to give you something. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, but again, th these are enablement platforms. These aren't, um, you know, uh, we need to do a feature comparison between a cloud and a, and a, a public cloud and a private cloud. So. Right. Last question, some of the yes, cool sir. stuff you're working on yes. as a CTO, I always like to ask CTOs that question. What, yeah, what, what's um, floating your boat these You days? know, one of the, the really interesting things to me is that we're finally getting there with anomaly detection. Um, not only, um, you know, just pure, uh, we found one event that, that, that went out somewhere that doesn't make sense, but we're profiling user behavior now. Uh, AI and machine learning has been one of the big items that, uh, you know, we've been promised for years, but a lot of times it was just a tagline. Uh, I think a lot of things that are happening uh, in the public cloud computing space around profiling users uh, and being able to reduce the amount of noise in the security space, uh, I think we're finally here. Uh, and I think, you know, in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, AI isn't be going to become a cool feature set, it's going to become a standard of a, of a lot of security so products. So applying machine intelligence to a lot of the data that you have, a lot of metadata, yep, that's yep. infrastructure metadata. Is, yeah, is yeah, and you know, even if you take, for instance, um, you know, I'll pull it back to our storage conversation earlier, if there's a storage um, activity, some storage activity that's outside the norm, that actually could be a security incident in itself. So, you know, pulling in data feeds is something that we've conquered. It's what, what are you going to do with it now? Uh, and we needed some humans to be able to pull that off before. Um, I think AI and machine learning is finally at the point where uh, it's not out of reach for your average customer. Uh, it doesn't take someone with a um, data uh, analytics degree or something like that. We can now buy uh, these kind of products off the shelf and, and leverage them for a lot of value. Well, Michael, you've been a great guest. Th thanks so much. You're welcome back anytime. All right, uh, happy to be here. Progress. All right, and thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante on theCUBE. We'll see you next time.